Greetings, all. Welcome back to the Captimizer Podcast. Got another amazing guest that we were just talking about, Dr. Laura King. She is a police chief in the. Well, I'll just I'm going to let her explain it because it's it's a <laughs> it's a very unique uh, circumstance, um, and right outside of Chicago, major metropolitan area, and yeah. Anyway, we're going to talk about a lot of cool stuff, but most of our conversation is going to center around officer safety and wellness. And welcome to the Captimizer podcast. Uh, I'm going to call you Laura, unless you want me to call you Dr. King. I I do not. I do not. Unless you want to start paying me. So <laughs> um, so uh, I'm a generational law enforcement officer. I've been on the job for 27 years. I uh, currently am the chief of police for the McHenry County Conservation District Police Department. We are one of the collar counties of, of Cook, which is where Chicago is. But um, we're we're only 40 miles from Chicago, but you you wouldn't know it from all the farm fields and open spaces that we have out in this area. So uh, this is, like I said, my retirement gig. I spent 20 years policing in a municipal atmosphere, uh, including some time uh, in undercover narcotics and in investigations. And uh, if somebody would have told me about open space policing a long time ago, I might have jumped ship back then. Um, during my police career, I did go back to school to finish my degree. Uh, I'm kind of a dork. I'm kind of an academic. So I just kind of kept going with that and uh, ended up earning my PhD in psychology. And that's primarily because I was fascinated. When I started studying psychology, I really thought psychology was going to help me understand the bad guys, like kind of like Jodie Foster, you know, and I was going to yeah. serial killers to yeah. give me confessions. And uh, as I went along in my academic pursuit, what I realized is psychology really held the keys to helping me understand, um, yeah, the offenders of crime, but but also victims and the victim experience, and, and maybe most importantly for me as a generational officer, what was happening in law enforcement to my coworkers and my peers and to law enforcement families. So I really got fa fascinated with psychology, uh, specifically self-care and personal wellness and how the wellness journey can be corrupted by the police profession and eventually compromise um, our physical and mental health wellness, but ultimately our officer safety. I love how you said that. I've never heard I've heard never heard anyone say it that way. Our mental health can be corrupted by the police system. So I that's a uh, that's brilliant. Uh, you should put that on a t-shirt. Um because it, you know, number 1, it's true. Uh I've just, you know, people yeah. talk about um corruption in police. That's that's generally not the way that the uh that the mind goes, but I think that's probably, you know, just a great way to kick off this conversation because, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, in the in the themes that we're trying to cover in this in this show is that we often look at um, we often look at problems downstream, not up, you know, not upstream. We're not trying to figure out what's causing the these these things. And um, uh, yeah, your work is is really important. So. Yeah, we're treating the symptoms, right? And in treating the sy symptoms, we're just prolonging uh, the illness. Uh, you know, so one of my favorite quotes is from uh, Kishmanerdi, who says, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And we as police see the sickest and the most damaged parts of society all the time. And it creates a state in our brain, which I like to call negative sentiment override, right? Where the darkness and the bad and the terrible things in the world are so much more obvious to us and noticeable to us than any of the good and, and the safe and the right things in the world. And in that shift in perception lies a lot of the problems that we start to see. And it's so prevalent. I fear that it's only getting worse as we move into a this digital age really the last the last 10 years and we've hit warp speed the last really the last five um and i don't i don't see any end in sight it really it really is a huge period of adjustment i, I quite frankly i just think for the human race uh a lot of the problems that this is creating 
Yeah. Um, and and you're right. So now with social media, unfortunately, there is some of society who, who've created probably unintentionally algorithms where they now too are only seeing the mad and the bad and the sad and the terrible and the destructive and the violent things in society. And so those persons, they might not have the lived experience, but they, they've got a front row seat on the sidelines, right? To all the terrible things that are happening. And you can see it in, in our rates of depression in our rates of addiction um, and in the social disconnection that's really occurring, you know, throughout our country when, when people don't feel safe with their neighbor, where they don't feel connected to their brother, when they feel like there's dangers on the other side of their front door, that's the unraveling of society as we know it. And if the police aren't out there doing a good job to help hold society together during these challenging times, who is going to do it? Yeah, it's almost like there's a mad scientist out there somewhere that's that's trying to take America apart piece by piece. Because uh, you mentioned something a minute ago, like uh, in terms of social media, uh, in that is you know maybe by accident that we're getting fed this negative information, uh, but it's not by accident. It's actually by design. Uh, it's it's the techno maybe the technology wasn't necessarily intended to be th this way but if you uh, I'm gonna give you, sorry to do this to you but if, no, if you okay. haven't or if you are haven't already read the book but read uh, Johan Hari's book Stolen Focus uh, it is it's really a brilliant work about um, how this uh, addiction to our devices is how it's impacting our psychology and our and our emotional mental well being. And he does this kind of really cool experiment where he he disconnects and he was just talking, you know, just part of the book is just the process of how difficult it is to disconnect. Uh, and he went up into uh, I, I think it was I think it was in New York, maybe upper Long Island. I'm, I'm not too familiar with that area, but it's kind of a remote area, um, a beach town, a small beach town that he goes to for a summer. But he completely disconnects and. He, he was, you know, it was funny. He was telling the story about how he was just trying to find a phone that wasn't connected to the internet and he couldn't find one. So it was like he wound up with this old flip phone. He had to buy a used laptop because uh, all the new laptops were all Wi Fi enabled. So he was, he was, he took some pretty good precautions for how he can keep himself from, you know, breaking down and actually connecting when, you know, if he, if he, uh, if he needs to. But, yeah, just so as it's so funny. Like as you're telling me that story, you you are you're really telling the modern day version of Henry David Thoreau and his experience on Walden Pond, right? Yes. So this this isn't a new concept, <laughs> right? And I would say for every generation, uh, except for Thoreau was more than a generation ago, right? But we keep going back to these primary universal truths and concepts that are hidden in plain sight that we don't always see. So one of the best things about policing in a, for an open space organization is, you know, we are in charge of the safety of the experience of these places where people come to seek health. They come to seek that detachment, that, that temporary time where they can unplug. I think they're calling it now in the parks and recs community, um, forest bathing, right? Yes, yeah. You know, where where you're just kind of out there and you're, you're you don't have your ear pods in. Uh, you're listening to the sounds of nature and you know you're you're breathing in the 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 smells of of the trees and the leaves and and the ground uh around you and it's just really a beautiful experience. And Thoreau knew it, and it sounds like your friend with the book Stolen uh, Focus knew it. But I guess every generation or so uh, needs needs a new person to to be the champion or the advocate for how important it is for us to slow our mind down. Uh, I don't know who said this quote, but one of my officers said it to me the other day. Um, he said, "You know, productivity can can be the enemy or the antithesis antithesis of." Um, of creativity. 
you know, and, and so yeah. it's uh antithesis. There you go. <laughs> but it's true. I, I knew what you were trying to say. I'm sorry. You know, I tongue tied, but, um, but it's true. Sometimes we move so fast and we're so busy doing things that we inadvertently shut down the part of our creative mind, which is really where our true genius lies. Well, it, and it also, I think it interferes with sometimes our capacity or our ability as, as you know, from a policing perspective to uh, police objectively. It, when yeah. you, it, when you get on that uh, hedonic treadmill every day, like same thing over and over again, like you're, and you're going call to call, call to call all day long. And like you said earlier, you know, we're not out there, you know, going, having coffee and tea, you know, we're dealing with people in crisis all day long, seeing the worst of the worst um, that, you know, I, I think there's a protectionism there that happens, you know, psychologically, you could probably give me the, uh, what the, you know, what, what the, what the term, the appropriate medical diagnosis for that might be, but you know, there, there literally is an insulation that occurs where it's like, I can only take so much. And, right. and, and I, you know, at some point I've got to create some barriers for me. So uh, that's why. Yeah. So uh, this is so fun. So this is kind of yeah. like emotional detachment, yeah. right? Where, where we don't let it bother us anymore. And I say all the time when, when I'm out training people, so like emotional detachment on the job that works. And that's a tool that you need to have when you're seeing the worst of the worst, when you're helping somebody else in crisis, when you are in the middle of their darkest moment and you're trying to be that beacon of light, you can't let your emotions get the best of you. You have to stay emotionally detached. And that is an important tool for you to have in your toolbox at work. But we use that tool so often, pretty soon it's it's laying on the top of our toolbox. If we start picking up that tool at home, that just makes us an asshole. <laughs> you know, and I'm not sure if I can say that on your podcast or not. Oh, sure. But, you know, say whatever you want. I mean, that's where our, our family is like, what's wrong with you? You know, like, wh yeah. why do you always see things so negative? I'm telling you a story that should make you happy, that should make you sad, that should make you emotional. And you're just meh, you know, you're, ju you're just straight faced through the whole thing. And that's dangerous, right? Because oh, that man. starts to compromise the quality of our relationships when we're not connecting on that emotional level with the people that we love. Yeah. And then to make it worse, we'll go right back to the digital, you know, what I call the doom scrolling, right? And we're all guilty of it. I'm sure I know I'm guilty of it. I guess I won't speak for you, but you get on and next thing you know, you get you know, emotional, you get sucked into some of these uh, discussions that are going on, whether it's a political discussion or whatever, and it pulls you right back in. And then it puts you, uh, so there's, you're not getting the disconnection, uh, the time to re-energize, and uh, well, you're not. It's it's yeah. a constant state of stress. And, um, you know, Sean Aker from Harvard University uh, calls it mental ADHD, you know, where we're yeah. constantly being stimulated. And then that becomes the new norm. And then we have that moment of peace. We have that that moment where we are unplugged or where we might be able to truly experience mindfulness or, or get into a meditative state. And it feels so foreign to us that that we back away from it instead of leaning into it. And leaning into it's the best thing that we could do. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is going to, we're going to go off in a different direction here, but that's okay. Um, so for the, for the officer that makes that observation that, that works with you, um, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's fascinating because the, the, in the police brain, you need to be able to tap into the creativity. You need to be able to, acknowledge that you know, not every call is the same and and one of the one of the bad habits that officers can get into is is having the call completed before you even arrive <laughs> right? right like i've done this a hundred times same story same thing in my mind i create the outcomes i've got the i literally have the story written i get there and now when something uh does not go according to that script that i have ready uh, it can create uh, a negative interaction with a, with a citizen, like you know, like, and Absolutely. they rightfully so are like, why why did I even call you? Like you're not even listening to me. All you right. know, it's it's like, uh, yeah, and, and you know, so they say, uh, Doctor Joe Dispensia says, you know, the predictable past soon becomes our future. 
because we feel like we've done it so many times that we like, we actually create it in, in what's in front of us. And that's not good for us. That's not good for the communities that we serve. And you are absolutely correct. But when we talk about creativity, I'm not talking about painting a picture or, or, or writing a book. Yeah. I'm talking about your ability to creatively problem solve. We have such a complex society. We see the most bizarre things. How do you come up to a solution to a problem that you never could have even imagined existed until you got to this call where all these bizarre things are happening and now you're the one that they expect to, to have a solution and, and bring that up. Without the creative part of our brain, we're going to fail to be as effective at our jobs as we could be. Well, there's a reason why television and popular culture uh, keep creating new cop shows, <laughs> new cop books. I, I'm like, I'm always kind of amazed. I'm like, ah, all right, well, I think we've done everything there is to do in the genre, but now no, yeah. we find new ways to new ways to do it over and over again. But well, and I think, uh, don't you think it's because our career is constantly evolving? I mean, look at it. In the 50s, it was uh, Andy Griffith, right? And then I, in the 70s, it was Barney Miller. And, you know, uh, in the 80s, I, I guess maybe I'm not sure you can help me. But then, you know, then it becomes nowadays. Miami like, Vice. Right. Miami Vice. Right. That's that's exactly who it was, you know. And then it was CSI. And now it's like there's comedies like Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And you just constantly have like the new generation and all the chaos um, that we're creating. Well, now, well, maybe not we're creating, but that 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 well, sometimes we're creating, but that oh, we're that, part of the, the show. chaos that we're responding to in our profession, the chaos that we're part of. Absolutely. They don't call it uh, the front row seat to the greatest show on earth for nothing. <laughs> and that's the, right. uh, and that's the human experience. Yeah. And, and right. You can't, and there, I learned, I learned a while ago to you, that you haven't seen it all. <laughs> no, I haven't seen it all. Uh, and yes, I can be amazed. And uh, right. there, there's always something. And I guess, yeah, that's, that's a, a bit of the gallows that, uh, gallows humor that has to come with it as part of, you know, you know, keeping a, an emotional detachment for, you know, which ultimately off time, oftentimes is a lot of misery and, and pain and suffering uh, for fellow human beings. But, yeah, but it, it's got to uh, be a tool. It can't become our default. Otherwise, yeah, life gets really hard for us as human beings. I do think it's interesting too. like um, you're on the north side. I'm on the south side of Chicago. You know, I'm a, I'm about an hour and a half south of Chicago, and you know, sometimes when you, when you're in the city, you feel like you know, there's nothing but the city. But then, you know, in within 30 minutes, you can be in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> like right. just cornfields all around on north side, south side, um, which you know, sometimes I think serves as a good, you know, should, I think serve as a good reminder to all of us that uh, there is a lot of, of diversity in the United States. And, you know, just because you're in a place like that today, or maybe you live there, doesn't mean that you can't get to someplace uh, in, you know, in a short, in short order, where you can find some peace, find some quiet, find, you know, the ability to reconnect with nature and, yeah. And, you know, nature is uh, it's the easy option. It it, make, it puts you physically present in that experience. But we can also find a way to escape the noise in the comfort of our own living room, you know, by adopting a practice of meditation, uh, by by practicing mindfulness, um, by turning off our electronics and just being silent and still. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if you're f familiar with the study. It was done out of uh, Harvard University several years ago, probably more than definitely more than 10 years ago now about um, meditation's impact on the gray matter in the brain and how just 21 minutes of meditation each day can actually increase the density uh, of the brain matter or actually make the brain stronger uh, and, and build resiliency. And the best thing about that study, they measured it with MRIs, you know, so it's hard science, but the best thing about that study was it didn't have to be a 21 minute block. You know, it could be three blocks of seven minutes. It could be seven blocks of three minutes. Uh, I don't see why it couldn't be uh, one, you know, 21 blocks of one minute, but, you know, so we can create that piece um, 
but that's a disciplined practice. And, and meditation is not something that comes very easy to people. And it's not something that you can just decide to do. It's it's a skill that needs to be uh, learned and, and grown and developed. And in order for you to reach level of mastery, where you're really getting the benefits, uh, it, it needs to be a dedicated practice. Well, I think I'm in about year five or six of my, uh, of my meditation practice. And I can tell you, I'm at, um, I'm still not there. <laughs> it's yeah. the, I have to, uh, I have to really work at it. And, uh, I, I guess this is a great, a, a great segue because, um, you, again, of, of the myriad of things that you've done in your background, one of the things that fascinated me, cause I want to go back and I, re- I really want to just kind of, you know, we've, we've, we've touched on, Hey, we know there's a lot of stress here. A lot of things can go bad. Um, maybe a little bit of why they can go bad, but also uh, as you're a police leader, you've got a tremendous amount of experience, not just on the job, but now also working and teaching around the country. Um, you you have the educational background. Now let's, let's, let's start talking about how we, how we put plans together and how we can bring some of these concepts to police departments. So anyone that's listening to this, uh, to this podcast, you know, they, they can take something away from it. They may not be able to do everything, but that's not the, that's not the point, right? It's number one, we just want to raise awareness of what's possible, uh, show people what other people are doing, talk about why it might be important and why it might be impactful. But, you know, meditation, it, you know, that's just, it's a perfect example. Not everyone like you, because now you're going to, you knew I was going to have to ask this. Now, now you're going to talk about your experience with the monks, right? So I, I sure can. Yeah, I'd love to so, hear about. Um, it. Yeah, so you know, before I get into that story, if I can just say, so this is really personal to me because police work broke my dad. You know, and so um, my dad did 32 years on the job in a small town surrounded by the city of Chicago on all four sides. And uh, he's just a different man on the backside of his career than he was when he entered into it. And from my childhood, I remember my dad as this fun loving, active, uh, hardworking man that was like really engaged with the family. And we'd have all these family trips and we had this lake house and and we we're just fishing and on the boat and 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 building sheds and forts and just doing all of these things together. And then at some point, my dad slowly slipped away. It happened right before my eyes. Uh, Had I known more then, I I would have understood the cause of it, Um, but I didn't because I was just a kid. And uh, it took a long time, but as I started to study psychology, I really realized that it was the toll of the cumulative stress of the job that, that took an impact on my dad coupled with his lack of knowledge and lack of practice of self-care. My dad rotated backwards every 28 days for over 20 years of his career. He never got a decent night's sleep. He was always eating on the go. You know, when you're tired, you're not making good food choices anymore. You're, you're seeking comfort food, um, you know, and, and things like, like exercise or, or meditation, or even, you know, monitoring your, your blood work or getting enough sleep. These weren't conversations that were had in my dad's generation of policing. And so when I entered this career, I was like, well, you know, police work broke my dad. My kids are not going to say that about me. And I don't want any of your listeners, kids to say that about them either. And so realistically, what happened with me is even though I knew it was the job, even though I knew the stress of the job really changed my dad, even though I was committed to it not happening to me, life gets in the way, you know? And so I'm very busy. I'm a young mother and I missed this promotion at work. Like this promotion that I thought I had, I had been busting my butt. I promise you I was the hardest worker in that room, right? I tried harder than anybody else and I didn't get the job. And it, it took the wind out of me. Okay. And so, uh, my husband at the time was, was mad. He was, he was upset as upset as I was, but in in an angry way, I was upset in a disappointed way. And, um, so then very slowly what happened at work started to dissolve uh, my marriage and I ended up getting divorced. Right. And I missed the promotion at work and I'm back on midnights and I'm trying my hardest to, to not let it get to me, but it's like, it's on me all the time. And, um, I get to the point where 
I feel, I feel like I'm losing it, right? I do not know what's wrong with me, but I feel like I must be dying. Like something is wrong. I can feel it. I go to the doctor. My, they take my blood pressure. My blood pressure is fine. Um, that, you know, they take, they take my blood, my blood works fine. I feel like I must be dying. And so, um, I go to doctor after doctor after doctor because everybody's telling me everything's okay and I know it's not okay. So eventually I end up with a doctor who's kind of a hippie and uh, he says, um, I want you to take this uh, hormone regulation test. Like you're gonna spit saliva into a, a tube and then we're gonna measure your hormones and see what's going on. So I get the test results back. He calls me and he's like, uh, come on in. You know, I got your test results back. I want to sit down and talk to you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, doc, am I dying? I mean, I really think I'm dying. Okay. And he's like, <laughs> that's because we all yes, do, right? Yes. You're dying. And I'm like, what? And he's like, no, we're, we're, we're all dying. And I'm like, you can't say that to people who think they're sick, <laughs> you know? And so uh, I go in and he, he shows me um, my, my levels for a couple of things. And he goes, I want to take you to, to cortisol, which is the stress hormone that exists in the body. He goes, so here's a chart, right? And it's a bell curve, normal bell curve. He's like, yeah, so this is what the normal person's cortisol looks like. It's low in the morning. As they start their day, it goes up, it peaks at some point, they come back home after work, it goes down. He's like, so your level, uh, it's not like this bell curve, like this axis, I've never seen it so high before. And, and yours is a straight line across the top of the chart. This was three days of saliva collection, right? Every single day, no fluctuation. I'm just riding the, the, the height of the scale in my levels of cortisol. And when there's that much cortisol in the body, you will feel sick. And I was like, oh my gosh, doc, I'm so glad I know what's wrong. What can we do about it? And he's like, well, before we get to that, I want to talk to you about what you're doing right. And I go, what do you mean? What am I doing right? I'm I, I, I'm here because I'm desperate to figure out what's going wrong. You see this, you said it's higher than you've ever seen and it never fluctuates. This is a big problem. He's like, yeah, you should be hypertensive. You should be obese. You should be diabetic. You literally should not like, what, what are you doing? And I was, I was doing yoga. I was working. I mean, I'm a cop, right? I have to take care of my body. And so I'm very active and I'm doing this exercise and I'm using yoga to try to help me relax. Little did I know it wasn't actually helping me to relax. And this is why blood work so important. And a normal blood test isn't going to show your cortisol levels, but you know, a lot of times these types of medical tests can give you early indicators. Had I not paid attention to that, I would have been your 40 something year old professional who went out on a jog, dropped, dropped dead of a heart attack. Right. And then every, yep. everybody would have been like, see, you shouldn't go to the gym and you shouldn't eat healthy because she did those things and she's dead anyways. <laughs> you know? Um, so this doctor said, I said, what do I do now? And so he he wrote on his prescription pad and I'm like, I'm not taking medicine doc. He actually wrote down the name of a book. It was uh Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now, oh, which yeah. is a book about mindfulness. And then he said, I need you to read this book and I need you to start meditating. And so I read the book. The book was very, very hard to read. So I got the audio book. Okay. <laughs> I got the paper book too. I, 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 you know, so I got the audio book and he's also like, you know, you need to get more sleep. You know, we went through my daily cycle. I was working midnights. I, you know, I was at home. I was exhausted. I had to go to work. I didn't want to be at work while I was at work. I'd get home. I only had about 20 minutes of patience uh, for my kids before I was like, you know, yelling, mommy, it's quiet, <laughs> you know? And um, uh, so I, I started to try to figure out how to meditate and it was really hard for me. And so I did guided meditation. I did breath work. I read all these books, you know, um, I read books from Navy SEALs on, on how to, how to get into this zone frame of mind uh, and nothing worked for me. And so finally uh, I'm fortunate. I have a Buddhist temple, not too far from where I am. And I went and I talked to the monks and they said, come in, we have these classes, it's community guided meditation. And they, um, they provided meditation and Dharma talks, but as they provided the meditation, they really gave instruction on how to let go of your emotions, let go of your attitudes, let go of your controlling behaviors. And so the biggest trick for me was people kept saying, focus on your breath, focus on your breath, just, just focus on your breath. Don't focus on anything else. Well, for me, focus on your breath was was basically control your breath, right? So I was doing like right. combat breathing or box breathing, and I was counting. And so the monks changed that language to notice your breath. Don't try to control it. Just notice it. 
Is it deep or is it shallow? Does you know? And so really through working with them, I was able to adopt a meditative practice. And then I started to use a meditative uh, biofeedback uh, tool. I used the the Zoom or the the Muse headband, and um, eventually I was able to get myself into a theta state. And uh, that was wonderful. And that meditative practice really has saved my life. And after I took up meditation, I was able to start sleeping better because I knew how to read my body and how to relax myself. Um, and uh, very slowly, I started moving in the direction of health instead of in the direction of, of sickness, which is what I was doing before. Yeah. So that's a, that, that's such a fascinating approach to this because I came at it from a different angle, same reasons, uh, just different approach. Um, and I think this is, this is the kind of thing that, uh, I hope that we can share with the next generation of officers, uh, because what, what people don't realize is that if you have, uh, elevated cortisol levels and, and they're elevated for a long time, not only does that create some significant long-term medical issues. I mean, it, it can literally kill you. Like, I mean, so you're not, I mean, you say, how, oh, you know, I, I would have been that cop that died or blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's, I mean, this is not hyperbole. This is, yeah. this is what's killing police officers. And um, yeah. And so when, when I went out to teach uh, before, I used to have this um, infographic that I put up and it was all the effects of elevated cortisol. And, you know, I would put it up and I wouldn't tell uh, the audience what it was. And it said, you know, hypertension, irritability, trouble sleeping, digestive discomfort, uh, you know, a headache. Hey. Anxiety, you know, like depression, all of it, weight right, gain, all of it, blood like, pressure. Like 20 things. And everybody's yeah. like, oh my, that's me. That's me. <laughs> and I'm like, no, this is high cortisol, right? I think this is all of us. So what do you do? So cortisol is a stress hormone, right? It's the bad guy, right? And we're cops. We know this. If there's one bad guy, how many good guys should there be? More than one. Yeah, more right? than one. Okay. Yeah. So we've got cortisol, it's elevated in our bodies. So now we need to do intentional things to that will normally in the body produce serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin. Right. So we're right. talking about sunshine, time in nature, exercise, healthy eating, getting enough sleep, spending time with people we love. If you don't like people, spend time with your pets. Right. You know, and all of the myriad of, of healthy things uh, that we can do. I mean, there's even some things like uh, like like music that we can play or even aromatherapy that we can use to help boost these feel good hormones in our brain. But unless we get really, really intentional about it because of the high stress nature of our job, we're probably going to let cortisol be the winner. And when the cortisol is the winner, we feel bad. And And the worst part is it creates a state of psychological exhaustion. And in the human body, psychological exhaustion presents like physical exhaustion. So this is why we go home. And even though we didn't really do all that much that was physically exertive at work, we feel completely exhausted. And we don't have time or energy to invest in self-care or in maintaining and nurturing the relationships with our family. And that is a recipe for a, a terrible life. Yeah. And you know, that's, you know, Kevin Goodmartin, right. He calls that the, the magic chair when you come home and crash into the magic chair yeah. and there's, you know, people, people have to understand there's a reason why the body produces cortisol. Um, it produces it, it you know, it, we're talking, we're entering into that fight or flight system. And it, when, when you're in a foot chase, you need cortisol, right? When you, well, when you need cortisol is not bad, right. too much cortisol is bad, right? Yeah. And right. so the, the, the roller coaster is the problem. And it's when we yeah. don't, when we don't have good practices in place to be able to modulate uh, cortisol appropriately, just like every, you know, it's like anything in life, right? Too much is, you know, can yeah. oftentimes not be a good thing, right? Yeah. You, we need everything in the appropriate dosage. And so for you, know, oftentimes the way that, elevated cortisol, some of the first symptoms that you may have elevated cortisol, but don't know it, right, is, uh, well, man, my my gun belt's a little bit tighter than it was, you know, a few weeks ago. And now next thing you know, it's like, well, I'm going to loosen that up a notch. Oh, that feels a little bit better. Uh, well, 
another month goes by, I'm gonna you know, loosen it up another notch. Next thing you know, you're 30, you're you're 30 pounds heavier than you were when you're in the academy. If right. you're not if you don't have a good plan in place and you're not putting it into practice. And so well, yeah. And it's not enough to just exercise because right. that, that creep happened to me and I was exercising, you know, I was exercising all the time and, but the weight was still put being put on and I'm a very conscientious eater. It's not like I'm going to McDonald's, you know, I'm eating healthy foods, but somehow this weight gain keeps creeping on. And that is a sign of high cortisol levels. It's the weights around the midsection. Yeah. And one of the things that we love about doing blood work and in particular with like the work that Dr. Greenwald's doing, uh, I know uh, Bill Cromwell and Precision Health Reports, um, uh, Sigma Tactical, I think is now doing it. There are, there is even, even five years ago, you couldn't find this. Um, So this is the benefit to Get your labs done so you have a baseline so you understand. Uh, know what your what we call the LPIR score, like your light the uh, your lipoprotein insulin resistance score. Know what that number is because y- you need if, if it's a, if it's elevated, then you're on the path. And you in the testing that we've done, I don't want to. I I've discussed this with uh, with Matt Martin in previous episodes, but and I know you and I have chatted about it, but the um in the populations that we've tested and then we've done uh some of these studies on and i presented this uh, in the the blood doesn't lie uh, presentation uh for iscp you're looking at, you know, at probably 60 percent of the police population is insulin resistant and it could be as high as probably 70 to 80 percent and it's it gen it it's it's trending that police administrators are actually running higher than uh, police officers. Now, why why is that important? Well, because insulin resistance is really what Dr. Gilmartin refers to as you know it's that hibernating bear. It's that it's the grumpy bear. Um, it's the it's that first sign that there are hormonal imbalances in your body. Inflammation is running high, and you need to get it under control because it's not going to it's not going to resolve itself on its own. Right. And so here's the thing is when when the when the body's not in a state of of natural homeostasis with the hormones, um, it's a challenging time. Right. Like so we I I have two young sons. Right. You know, uh, and we all remember uh, puberty. If we don't have children, we probably remember it from our own normal life. And, you know, teenagers who are going through this time of of drastic uh, hormonal change, even though it's a normal and natural part of the body's develop, it's still very, very hard for them to control their mood, right? And yep. and you get these outbursts in these moments of rage. Now, um, that that's hormonal imbalance because of, of natural causes, but we can cause hormonal imbalance because of illness later in life. Um, and then if you add on top of that, fatigue, right? Which is where a lot of the hormonal balancing is happening in the body is when we're asleep, the body's naturally regulating cortisol levels and reproducing serotonin. And this is all occurring during our deep sleep cycles. If we're not getting the deep sleep, if we're getting pseudo sleep, or if we're not getting sleep at all, our body doesn't have a chance. And then the situation that you're talking about is, is kind of getting worse and worse. And so, um, I know that, you know, this Patrick, but like, you you know, you, you know, you're familiar with toddlers, right? Well, what is an over top tired toddler act like, right? They're, they're irritable. They're angry. They're unreasonable. They're throwing temper tantrums. Well, what does an overtired cop look like? Right. I, I mean, and the answer is the same. So, you know, it's, it's fatigue, it's hormone regulation, it's this insulin resistance. And what's happening is we're creating the perfect storm. The good news is the body is a miracle machine and it is never too, as long as you are still living and breathing, it is never too late to start the body moving back in the right direction. Uh, But the bad news is, is the longer you've been on that path, right? The the deeper you go into the woods, the farther you have to come to come to get out. And so that's, I think the importance of 
of the blood testing that you're talking about is the earlier we can detect this, the younger we can educate officers on this and teach them to self-monitor, the less of a chance for them to get so deep in the woods that they feel lost. Because that's really what happened to my father. You know, he he's so dark. He's so deep in the in the woods with this, um, you know, lack lack of healthy habits that I don't know that he knows that there's a good, happy, well-rested, uh, you know, energetic quality of life that he could find. And I know it's there, right? And I try to tell him it's there, but everything in his past and in his feelings and his emotional experiences is telling him that that it's it's deep and it's dark and and, you know, the woods feel safe to him. So he's just kind of spent a lot of time there. So I want to, I want to really highlight this because it's, it, again, it kind of touches on this theme that we have, we oftentimes blame individual officers for systematic failures of, of the system that we're asking them to work in. And I'm just going to go back just a couple of weeks, right? Because uh, this was just right before all of the um, the hoo-ha, you know, from uh, the Memphis case. But there was, I don't know if you saw this or not, but there was a, uh, and again, I, I don't have all the facts and circumstances, but I just remember reading a, a brief story about it, but a, a supervisor in Chattanooga, Tennessee, falls asleep, he's asleep and someone films him asleep at, at the wheel in his car. And now, you know, now there's an IA investigation. So if someone comes to you and says, I just found one of your, you know, uh, your lieutenant sound asleep in his car and, you know, he's sleeping on duty and I, I, you know, I want him fired. I, you know, I think, you know, she needs to lose her job, blah, blah, blah. And without any real care or concern, that's just absolutely insane. So horrible. You know? is, and so but, when I got to this agency, um, we had, we had people rotating every three months, not everybody, but some people. And I was like, we have to stop that. And they were like, oh, no, no, union contract, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, listen, this is just not healthy for you. <laughs> the rest of me, board is that it's not healthy for your body. It's not healthy for your family. It's not healthy for our agency. And so, you know, we talked through it and we worked through it. But this is part of the reason that I'm such a huge proponent for these uh, restorative restrooms or whatever you want to call them, these restorative break rooms. Absolutely. You know, because if you look at the science on napping, listen, your cops get 15 minute breaks a couple times a shift. They get their 30 minute lunch. You, we all know there's productive and non-productive time. Well, what if they could use that non-productive, right, patrol time in a productive manner to restore and rejuvenate themselves? I mean, they say a 20 minute nap can have the equivalency of about of what feels like four hours of sleep on the black back end, yeah. you know? So, um, I mean, if we could encourage our officers to taking their break in the restorative break room, right. And, and trying to unplug for a little while and, and give their body and mind a rest instead of like shopping on Amazon or playing angry birds or going on social media. I don't know how people are spending their breaks in your world, but like realistically, I, I mean, I have eyes, I see what's happening, you right. know? And so it's just self-care. And so for so long in our profession, we were taught that, uh, you know, self-care is, uh, you know, soft and I'll sleep with I'm, when I'm dead. And, you know, we wore our lack of sleep around like a badge of honor on our uniforms. It's so dangerous. It's so broken. It's so backward. It's so unhealthy. And if you want to know why we're addicted, uh, depressed and divorced, <laughs> you know, and anxious, it's because we're not taking care of ourselves. And you can say we're not taking care of ourselves because of the stress of the job. But realistically, the stress of the job is the symptom and, and its manifestation in our body is the symptom the true cause is the lack of self-care. Yes. And this is an officer safety issue because, you know, I spent a lot of time in the suicide awareness space. Uh, and But the, at the end of the day, we are more of a danger to ourselves than, than all of the bad guys combined right? When, when it comes to how we lose our lives. And, and if you add into those suicide statistics, the, the addiction and the anxiety and the depression, and just the, what I, what I call the slow suicides that so yeah. many of our retired members are, are in process of, um, it's, it's terrible. It doesn't have to be this way. This job, this is one of the best jobs in the world. It's one of the most noble callings that there ever has been. 
if we could just take better care of ourselves because we see that we we put ourselves through these excruciating psychological experiences. If you were an extreme athlete and you knew you were going to go through these excruciating, uh, out of the ordinary physical experiences, you would train, you would prepare yourself. Well, to, to train and to prepare yourself for those psychological experiences, it's self-care. You need to take care of your body. You need to get exercise. You need to get sleep. You need to be feeding yourself your macros. You need to be checking your blood, right? That's the preparation that we need to get through our ultra sport, which, which is really seeing the darkest of the psychological experiences of the world. And I, I don't want to go too far into it, but for those that are interested, right, there are there are things that you can do. And um, it would be great if we could get more and more police departments to take uh, a wellness approach um, and be, you know, create wellness robust programs like Laura's created and her agency. Uh, but there are things that you can do individually um, that, there, there is an episode uh, that I uh, that I had with uh, uh, Dr. Cat, uh, well, Dr. Plua. She, she's a she's a research scientist, and she is using uh, you know wearable technology and digital technology to uh, improve wellness. And she, you know she works in the healthcare space, but she's done a lot of work uh, very similar to what you have. And we got into a conversation. So I, I, I wanted to ask you about this after I was talking with her because she's a civilian. Um, she's a scientist and she's brilliant and she's done a lot of the work and, you know, from her sp perspective, she was just like, well, why wouldn't you do this? Like, <laughs> like I, I can give you some wearable technologies. That's going to give you really hard data on, what your recovery is and and how well your body is functioning. Why wouldn't you want that? And so, uh, you know, the question ultimately, and I've had this conversation with with uh, several people, and you know, here is the next frontier. You know, right. you're a chief, I, right? And like, I know and, the answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, why, I know. why why would cops not do that? Because we're paranoid. Okay. And if you yeah. don't know a paranoid cop, then you need to go in the mirror and 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 take a hard look at yourself because it's probably you, right? But we all know that guy or gal in our department who thinks everybody's out to get them all the time. Well, guess what? There are people that are out to get us, right? And yeah. so the fact that we're elevated on the paranoia scale, scales of, of psychological testing after a certain amount of years on the job, that is a normal behavior to the abnormal circumstances that we see. But with that paranoia, so I bought the Aura Ring, right, for the people on my department, which is, which is a biofeedback tool. I'm not saying it's the best one. I'm saying it's the one that we use. I bought it for myself and my husband. Uh, we loved it. We couldn't believe the data and how it was informing our decisions every day. And, you know, I offered, it was used by NBA and NASCAR as an early COVID detection device because it elevates or it uh, detects early elevated body temp. I said, if you want this, I'll buy this for you. And so half of my department took it and half of my department didn't. But there was a big discussion, not in front of me, right? And the ones that didn't take it, they were they were worried that I was going to be able to track it, that I was going to be able to access it, that it was some type of trick and someday, and then that they're going to get somehow disciplined for like not getting enough sleep or something, right? And like, uh... I, this is not, again, I was a newer chief back then. I didn't have the same level of trust that I have today. But when you take people whose profession hasn't served them well, hasn't focused on taking care of their health and focused on their wellness in a robust way for an extended period of time. And then you introduce these tools or these opportunities for you to try to help them to do that, to empower themselves. I don't want your data. I want you to pay attention to your data. I'm going to pay attention to my data. If you want to share it with me, I'll have a healthy conversation with you, but, but you don't have to, and I don't have access to it. But, you know, it's that paranoia, right, that 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 how is this going to be used against me is the union is what if what if I get in an accident on duty? Are they going to see how much sleep I got or something? Right. It's like this this whole conspiracy theory thing that so many cops have going on. Well, you know, there's always a, a bit of a, a bit of truth to every good conspiracy. Right. So I think right. that's I think that's I think that's where it usually stems from is that somewhere somehow, you know, uh, somebody took a good thing and ruined it and yep. uh, used it, you know, for the, for the wrong reasons. 
Um, and oftentimes when it comes to lawsuits and when it comes, especially when it comes to deep pockets, uh, that's, um, that's, that's where it comes. But I did have, I did have this conversation with Dr. Cat, and I think that's, uh, one of the things that I, I really, really want executives to start thinking about this, right? You know, I wear, I wear a whoop strap and this was at the recommendation of, uh, my coach. So I, you know, and again, you know, our, this show, we're, we're really being uh, sponsored by Performance Protocol, which is a company that's bringing the, the executive coaching into policing. This is kind of one of these things where I, I just, I'm fast, I'm, you know, I geek out, I'm a nerd myself, I geek out on data, I geek out on information, but I like to know, I like, you know, I like to tinker and I like to find out what, you know, where's the positive impact and 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 how can I use that, you know, to benefit my performance. But in the end, really, it's like, I, I was really lucky that early on in my career, I stumbled into some data that really woke me up like, hey, this is, you got to take this serious because, um, you know, this job, uh, it's, it's, it's not the, well, certainly the assaults can get, get you right. The firearms can get you, Yeah. but let's, let's be honest, right? Let's, let's just be honest. Let's look at the last few years, as bad as the last few years have been, What's the number one killer of cops? Suicide is higher than all line of duty deaths combined. But yeah. I would say heart disease is definitely our number one killer. But but our data sets, right, isn't super strong there yet because right. we're not really tracking it occupationally. Also, like in the fire science, I don't know if you're aware of this. So my, my ex-husband and my brother are both firemen. So firemen, if they have a heart attack 24 hours before duty or 24 hour after duty, at least here in Illinois, it's considered an on-duty heart attack. Yeah. Because they re they re realize the stress of the job doesn't stop and end when when you punch in and punch out, right? So if you look at our heart disease and how heart disease is affecting our officers and heart attacks is affecting our officers, if you put those same parameters where you extended it to before and after duty, you know, because firemen work usually 24-hour shifts in Illinois. So if you work a 24-hour shift and then you're covered 24 hours before and you're covered 24 hours after... The only time you can have a heart attack while, while you're a fireman uh, and not have it be an on-duty heart attack is if you're on vacation, right? you know? Yeah. Or on and, that and second so, or third but, day off, yeah. Right. So how many of our cops, right, have have a, a major event on duty, they go home and, and they have the grabber, you know, the next, that night, the next morning, the next day. All the time. And, you know, yeah. uh, 30, and I just had this conversation also, uh, la and the last I knew the, and this has been a couple of years, so I'm going to have to do some research on this. But thir 37 of 50 states were presumptive are presumptive benefit states, and that's the that's the law that allows the fire service to have those rules in place, right? Where it become if you have a heart attack, um, on or off duty, and, and the way it is in Nevada is, um, if I remember correctly. If you've been on the job for five years, it might be three, but I think it's five years. If you've been a police officer for five years, they've got enough data to be able to support that. If if you have a heart attack, whether you're on duty or off duty, it's considered a workman's comp. Related. Yeah, it's a yeah, workman's listen, comp issue. That's the way that it should be, okay? Because really, this is this is very significant for our profession. But the great news about this, right, is this is within our control. This is easy. I mean, there are some things in science that we still don't understand, but the science behind behind creating heart health, cardiovascular benefit, like, I mean, this is not really where science is lacking, right? We know how to do this. We know how to get there and intervene. The question is, is our agency supporting officers in doing this? And the other thing is the body and the mind, they are connected. They're one. I mean, we talk about mental health and, and psych, you know, physical health like they're two different things when they're really, really not. And I was challenged in a training class the other day. They were saying, we're trying to get the guy to EAP. We're trying, we're trying. He won't go. He refuses. You know, we can't mandate him, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, put him on an exercise routine. Make him work out every day. The, the, I, like, you want my recommendation if you really can't get him to, to engage in mental health services, which I don't understand for the life of me, but okay, Get him yep. to start taking better care of his physical health because the body and mind are connected. And he starts getting those endorphins and that that, that boost and, and that good adrenaline and starts burning the adrenaline off instead of letting it sit in his system. 
his mind is going to start feeling better. And then maybe you can talk him into getting the intervention that he needs because we're losing people and we don't want that. But, well, you know, it, it's been years, right? Just kind of yeah. like this ring and data and paranoid thing. For years, our profession has used psychiatric inter- intervention as discipline and discipline only. So now we've got this new generation of people who are saying, hey, it's not discipline. It's part of a wellness package. We're trying. We're not, we don't want to wait till you get sick. We want to keep you healthy. And our people are skeptical, ske- skeptical. And it, it's natural and it's normal and it's understandable. Two, 2% of police departments have manda- mandatory physical fitness standards. Uh, if we, but every police officer has a mandatory standard that they have to meet in order to graduate from their police academies. Um, right. So if you look at the fitness level, the emotional stability, wellness level, now granted age, um, you, when you're, when you're young can have a significant, you know, it, it can, yeah. You know, age can, you know, it can, it can absorb a lot of, of really bad habits, yeah. but they are cumulative and they, they, it's not, it, it's just, you know, we're, you know, we're paying later. Right. Yeah. Um, well, and my admin is great, but he'll be, he can literally read me. He'll be like, you missed CrossFit today, didn't you? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I did. He's like, I can tell. Would you just go? If it won't go for you, go for me. You're like, you're in a better mood. You're, you're easier to talk to. You're, you know, and it's true, right? It's true for me. It's true for everybody. Well, and, and I've, I've talked about this book a couple of times, but if anyone, if, if they're curious about the science behind this, read uh, John Rattay's work. Uh, he wrote a book called Spark. Uh, and then he he wrote a follow up book later called Go Wild. But in in Spark, he talks about the um, and and actually so right up in your neck of the woods there, Naperville, the Naperville. There is a uh, one of the one of the stories featured in the book comes from the Naperville school district about uh, a PE coach that got tired of of kids just coming in and sitting down. And it's been a while since I read it, but uh, you know, basically paraphrasing, uh, hey you know, got tired of my students just coming in and learning the, the, the rules of field hockey or something where gym class went from actually where you were physically active to, right, to a theoretical class. <laughs> yeah. And to uh, like right. ki- some kids did, some kids didn't, but he, he went out and bought. So we're going to talk about devices again and data. He went out and bought some heart rate monitors and passed them out to his kids, this gym teacher. And he says, I don't care what you do. I just want you to, to get your heart rate in between this zone. And so they, they could play basketball, they could walk up and down the bleachers, they could jog in circles, whatever. But what the, again, a long, long, uh, uh, the short version of this long story is what they found is that as kids started doing that, um, their behavior, their behaviors improved, changed, and guess what? Their grades started to go up. So then they said, well, wow. Uh, and they started calling it new PE. So in new PE, like if someone's struggling with math, walk uh, to school. <laughs> yeah, if they're struggling with math, let's put them in new PE right before, uh, right before math class. Guess what? Test scores start going up. Yeah. And well, at the science behind it, so there is there's science behind it is that uh, brain derived neurotropic factor, which is the base chemical for base hormone for all your chemicals in your brain, right? Like um, your uh, GABA, your serotonin, your dopamine, all of these, uh, that's the, there's a connection between the brain and the gut as these things are produced. And one of the best ways to produce it, one of the really only ways to produce it is through uh, vigorous, continuous exercise. So you got to get your heart rate up to us. And, and why is that? Well, because that's the way the human uh, species evolved. They evolved right. through, body through was movement. was designed for this. And right. so when it's being sedentary is actually bad for your health. And what do cops do? I mean, Sit as much as we day. like, to, as much as right. we like to think that we do things. So, so this is kind of where I go back to the cortisol, right? And, and you, yeah, you know, you're getting in a car in and out. You, you maybe you get in a fight, maybe you get in a foot chase, but those, you know, that's not happening every day. But for the most part, you're driving around, you're sitting down and you're experiencing very high stress levels. Your cortisol levels are up and your this is where the hormonal balance gets out of whack. And so what happens when your cortisol levels are spiked? Ah, oh, man, 
I I'm, I feel hungry. Like I need to eat like, because that's your body craving glucose. Like, Hey, I need some blood sugar. Hey, we're on, we're on the, we're on the prowl here. We're on we're the hunt. Ready. Right. Uh, let's go feed me, feed me, feed me. And well, I'm not really hungry, but I'm going to eat anyway. And what's, what's hanging around every, every uh, cop station around, right? <laughs> it's like, this is where the cops and donut jokes come in right. because there's cookies, there's candy bars, there's soda in the vending machines. It's everywhere you look. And so, oh man, I mean, we are just, we just keep throwing fuel on the fire and it's, it's and not in a good way. So well, I, we really do. And, you know, so we get those calls for service, right? Baby not breathing, fire, burglary, you know, and you go there and it's a false alarm. You've already had your adrenaline dump when the call yeah. came out, right? When you were driving there. And now all of that adrenaline's released into your system. And if that adrenaline is not used up through fight or flight, which if it's a false alarm, you're not doing either of uh, unused adrenaline turns into cortisol, which is why the best thing you could do at the back end of your shift is, is go to the gym and work out. Right. But yep. that, that, un, that flooded cortisol in your system will make you feel psychologically exhausted. So you feel like you can't work out. So this is where I try to use that uh, cold water trick, right. To try to get people out of that cortisol funk because, time in uh, cold water exposure. So it, it's best if you submerse yourself, but you can do it by standing in a really cold shower. Um, but, you know, cold water exposure for a couple minutes can increase your dopamine levels by 200%. I mean, that's crazy science. That's better than any drug out there. I say all the time when, when the crack addicts find out about yeah. this, right? They're going to be <laughs> off the needle and in the ocean, you know, but uh, I mean- Lake Michigan. Yeah. Like, so let's trick ourselves. If I, I, I life hack, right? Yeah. Like you feel like crap after your shift, you were supposed to go out to dinner with your family. You don't feel like going anymore. Take a freezing cold shower for three minutes. You're going to be fine. For, for your agency and for, for the wellness initiatives that you've put together. Um, you were talking like right before, like at COVID one, uh, during COVID, one of the ways that you found like, Hey, the, here is a device that I can give to, my officers that will give them some data that might be able to help them predict when they might be getting sick and when, hey, let, um, don't be around yeah. people today. Right. Don't come to work because it, during COVID, our whole everything went remote except for the cops and, and a couple of the field workers. And so, um, you know, we were there were so many unknowns. Right. And so it was just like, hey, I found this device. Let, let's do it. Let's use it. And if if your body temp is elevated, don't come in, move your day. I didn't make them take a sick day, you know, but I mean, we were we were very fluid. We were very flexible. We were working with our staffing levels. But um, I know two people for sure. We stopped from coming to work with COVID and probably getting the rest of us sick because their ring showed them elevated. They felt totally fine. And it wasn't until that second or third day where they realized they were super sick and they would have been at work the couple of days before had they not been listening to, to the biofeedback. So um, my wife wears the aura ring. I do, uh, she she just didn't, um, she didn't want the strap. And so the aura ring, yeah, she just like, ah, that. that yeah, I, I like the that. ring better too. Yeah, I think I, it's definitely more convenient. Um, and, and they both track HRV heart rate variability, um, which is, which is again, another good data point for, uh, and this is where I think for individual awareness for, for an officer, I think it's, I think it's really important because when you look at, um, when your recovery is, is in the red or when it's really low, it doesn't mean you, you can't exist and survive. It's just telling you, Hey, look, you know, you should be aware that, uh, you may not want to max out your uh, your effort today, whether it's through exercise or or anything else you're going to be doing today. Well, and just maybe letting for... you know, right? Like yeah. whatever you've been doing lately, it did not set your body up for optimal performance. So right. when I first got the Aura Ring, I was consistently readiness score of 30. And the readiness score is a combination of the HRV and your sleep cycle and your activity level, okay? And so they use some algorithm. I don't really know the ins and out of it, but it comes up with a readiness score. And so, you know, very slowly, what I would notice is on the days when I when I felt better, my readiness score was higher. And the days that I felt bad, 
my readiness score was lower. And then pretty soon you start to realize that the amount of exercise, the time of the day that you exercise, your amount of sleep, if you're consuming alcohol, if you're indulging in sugar, all of these things are affecting this readiness score. My readiness score is now consistently in the 80s and sometimes in the 90s. And if it falls below 85%, I feel it, I know it. And I make changes to get it back up because the difference in me existing when my HRV is at a healthy level, when I've had enough sleep and when I've had the right amount of activity, those days, those days feel light and I feel energized and I'm happy and I'm in the world and I want to connect to people and and my, my family doesn't irritate me, right? And it's just like a great, it's a great life. And those days when my readiness store is lower, I'm not happy. I'm not feeling good. And the sad thing is before I got this ring, I was like that, I think, all of the time. And so that stinks for me and probably for my job performance. But more important than any of that, that stinks for my family. That stinks for my kids because that means mom's crabby, mom's tired, mom's making excuses to not do the things that mom promised to do. And that's my life, Patrick. That's exactly what happened to me when I was a kid. And and except for my dad didn't have a biofeedback device. He didn't figure out what was taking his energy and his spirit away from his family. And so and... I love my dad, all right? He's still around. He's covered in a layer of uh, anger and alcohol. But, <laughs> but I know my dad's still inside there and I'm still trying to break him out. But, you know, like I, I wear this, not for me at work. I wear this for, for me at home. For, for well, me with my husband and we, me with my kids. And you know what, that that's a, that's such a powerful story. And um, yeah, you know, and, and this is sometimes, you know, when you go back to the paranoid cop, right? Like when, when we're on edge like that, when we're, when we're suspicious and uh, listen, everybody knows who they are, right? Because they're, uh, we can all get there. Um, especially when you're night working nights and you're, when you're busy a lot, but you know, this is kind of where, where we're training people, uh, you know, the duty to intervene, you were training in from a use of force perspective, but what I've been trying to get people to understand is that you have a duty to intervene as a friend and as a partner. Like when you see someone going down the dark path, you got to tell them you're not doing them any favors when you ignore it or worse when you uh when you acknowledge it and and then justify it like oh yeah 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 you're right man this is you know uh you know it's all bullshit right as kevin was that's uh, right yeah you're right you're right and then that is the you know that is the vortex that's gaining momentum and you know that's i, I use that example right sometimes if one is bad two makes it worse right and then four you can really get that, you know, you can really get the momentum going. So it's a, a device like that. It's neutral. It's unbiased. It, it's not the chief trying to to backdoor you into some kind of IA investigation. I mean, it's some of the th- some of the level of paranoia and things that you hear when you're chief, it's just like, wow. Yeah, that's, yeah but some, that's some really chiefs creative. Failed, failed their people, right? Yeah. You know, and and like you said, you know, we're we're living in the shadow of those haunts, you know, and I don't blame the people who are are not trusting. um, But but I am willing to prove that I'm trustworthy to my people. And, you know, it 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 takes a lot of time uh, to build trust and it takes just a second to, to sweep it away. You know, so we're just on this road to progress. All of my people, even the ones that did not take the ring, they know uh, at any time if they want it, they can come to me. And I'd also be happy, you know, to get them a a, a whoop band. I mean, anything that you're going to use for self-improvement. You know, uh, one of my favorite leadership books is the book Legacy by James Kerr which is about rugby. Okay. It's about oh, yeah. the New Zealand all blacks. Yeah. Right? The all blacks. Yep. Yeah. And in the book, he says better people make better all blacks. Right. Well, guess what? Better people make better police officers too. You know? So w- when we want to talk about taking care of our cops, we have to realize that they're more than cops. They're people. And we have to be invested as organizations and as leaders of these organizations in truly 
caring for our people and making sure that we are establishing an organization with practices and procedures in place that will make it easy for people to take care of themselves. Because sometimes the difference between illness and wellness is the difference between I and we. And if you write those words on the board, right, they're spelled the same, except for the I in front of illness and the we in front of wellness. So when we try, when we let people do it on their own, people turn out like my dad, right? But when we all do this together and we create a culture of wellness and we're looking out for each other and we call each other out and call it, and hold each other accountable when we misstep or, or, or go off the path and we bring people back in line, it's easier for us to take care of ourselves and find a place of wellness because we're doing it together. Yeah. And, and where I was going is you, if you're that person, you may not realize it. And if you have someone that will grab you and pull you up, just like the same, it, you know, if one of those guys in Minneapolis grabs Derek Chauvin and pulls him off, just think the trajectory, like we've, we've changed, changed everything, we've changed everything. And yeah. so for someone to grab you and say, Hey, look, Hey, listen, uh, you, you know, you're, you're in a bad way and it's time to, it's, you know, I, I'm just pointing it out to you. Having, the, having this data, it doesn't lie to you. Right. right. And, uh, and I, we had this conversation and I, I want to use this opportunity to, you know, really talk about one of the, I think another amazing program that you put together, but when you're trying to figure out, okay, it, it, all right, it's, it, I acknowledge, um, I'm in a bad way. I'm I'm 50 pounds overweight. I don't feel good. My energy levels are down. I got to start moving in the right direction. Um, you know, it's it's like yeah, the, it, you know, the old adage, right? How do you eat an elephant, right? It's just one bite at a time. So don't try, you can't try to do everything at once. You just got to take it piece by piece, but that just that little piece of awareness can move you in the right direction. And then and then you find out like when you when your score was 30, um, you know, one of the, you know, again, once you start seeing this, if you're data oriented, you're like, all right, well, how do I get that better? How do I get that better? And, you know, that can be a, an unhealthy obsession in and of itself. But, uh, one of the things that I found is, and I'm not a big drinker, um, but I do like bourbon. I like to think, I like to experiment with different bourbons. I like to try different bourbons, but, uh, you know, when I was younger, I could party with the best of them. But, you know, when you're working nights for 15 years, I, w I was just fortunate that I just uh, I was just, you know, I was usually asleep or working. So I just, you know, socially, it was just never it, it was never something I did, you know, I did frequently. But, uh, you know, in, in my my CrossFit side of me and my competitive side of me, when I'm trying to like when I'm preparing and training for competitions, and I'm looking at, you know, I'm, I'm tracking times on workouts. I'm tracking macros and, and my meals. And and then now suddenly I've got this tool that I can actually, you know, check my resting heart rate. I can, you know, I can, you know, I, I can see these different data points and then I can look to see what's impacting them. And then, burr, 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 burr. right. <laughs> I see what alcohol does yeah. to my HRV. And I was like, for me, three days. It alcohol will jack me up for three days. And so do I want to feel bad for three days? And and truth be told, and I think you know the story, Patrick, like I used to be, I thought a normal social drinker, right? I'm a divorced person. Uh, my kids would go to their dads on Wednesday night. My husband and I would have date night. We'd have a couple glasses of wine. Then uh, we, you know, I wouldn't drink when my kids were home. But then on the weekends, there usually would be an adult event in there Friday night, Saturday, maybe Sunday. Uh, and so then I'd be drinking then. Well, if I'm drinking and it screws my HRV up for three days and I'm drinking every Wednesday and probably at least one days of every weekend, I'm pretty much keeping myself in a compromised state of non-optimal performance indefinitely right? And that's a recipe for disaster. So um, I'm way more intentional about my drinking now. And it's, it's, it's great. I mean, I like I spent a lot of time in the elective sobriety space, because I'm just like, how good can I feel? Now, when I was undercover, I swear to you, I, I think I drank every single day for three years. I don't think there was one day while I was undercover that we didn't drink. Even on the weekends, we were hanging out together as a unit and we weren't, you know, schnockered necessarily, but there always seemed to be uh, uh, an elbow to bend. And so 
when I got pregnant with my first child, man, I felt amazing during my present pregnancy. And, and women were like, oh, aren't you like achy and this and that? And I'm like, no, I feel amazing. <laughs> right. And then I had my second <laughs> kid. Well, it wasn't until I did my first alcohol free challenge where I was alcohol free for an extended period who was like, I don't think it was pregnancy that was making me feel great. I think it was no alcohol in my system that was making me feel great. Because, you know, if you really want to achieve that, like kind of elevated space, um, you know, doing a detox, taking a break from from that stuff that's hard for your system uh, to process, it's a great way to do it. That doesn't mean you have to be sober forever, right? But but we should be intentional about the things that we're doing that have an impact on the health and wellness of our body, especially when that can directly be related to our ability to be prepared to do this job, because this job can get really serious really quickly. Um, Andrew Huberman, the Huberman Lab podcast. I think you and I talked about it, but I just had to say it for for the audience. If you've never listened to his episode on alcohol consumption, uh, stop what you're doing right now. Write it down. Huberman Labs. Uh, he's on all the major po- podcasting uh, platforms, and just do the search for alcohol consumption. And uh, you know he's he's not an anti-alcohol person, but he's just gonna he's gonna break the bad news to you that. Yeah, there. Yeah, as much as we might want to believe, like, oh well, if I drink red wine, I'm getting resveratrol, and that'll make me, uh, you know, that's a that's a a great antioxidant. I can live forever, just like, uh, yeah. Uh, the yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, just tell it to your HRV. I mean, like the data yeah. doesn't lie. And and again, this is like having a biofeedback device. It's like a relationship with a counselor. It's just giving you honest feedback, right? And, and, and nobody else has to know about it. And it's just between you, you and your app, but um, you know, that that's the truth right there. And you could tell me a million different times that alcohol wasn't good for me and it was a toxin and it was compromising my ability to whatever, but until you see the data and then you feel the difference, you know, all all of that's just kind of lip service. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, and, and again, I'll uh, just use myself as an N of one, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm competing in a Spartan Decca race in March. So I've been training. Um, and usually when I'm, when I'm training for competitions, I, I don't drink or, you know, it's, it's, you know, I certainly don't drink very much. Um, and my, the, you know, in, and in this time period, since I've started, uh, it getting, you know, ramping up and getting ready, my, uh, my recovery is up 8%. Yeah. And, um, and, and in, in all that, I've also had uh, COVID. I did a, did a stint with COVID. So uh, I'm a three-time uh, COVID loser, but, you know, fortunately for me, like my, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, well, if you can trust the test, but the, the, whether they're accurate or not. It's like a flip of a coin. Right? Yeah. You know, fortunately, <laughs> yeah. Fortunately for me, they're, they've been pretty mild. Um oh. We should sell that. We should make coins. And on one side, it, it'll say COVID positive and the other side will say COVID negative. And we'll yeah. sell them as COVID tests. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what, and it, it, that does remind me, one of the things that I, you know, when I ask you what, like the leading cause of uh, killer of cops for over the last few years, um, oh, you know, so very COVID. sadly, COVID right. is, is one of them. And Oh, for sure. Now, if you look, so I, and when I do this, I, I usually look at long, long, longitudinal, longitudinal studies. Yep. And so I extrapolate the COVID numbers because hopefully, you know, it's a, a temporary phenomenon. But yes, you are absolutely correct. Like I think in 2021, it was like 140 something officers, all line of duty deaths combined in 301 for COVID. In yes. that year, there was 170 suicides. So yes, definitely COVID is taking it. But again, then then people want to, you know, they want to say, well, did they die of COVID or did they die with COVID? And, uh, you know, the, all these like crazy conversations. But here's yeah. the thing. The people like you, right, that that were healthy and in a good state and, and, and knew they were really, really strong. A lot of times COVID was milder. It was the people with the underlying health conditions that COVID seemed to hit most severely. And I'm not saying that there's not anomalies in there because I don't know every single person and their experience. But yeah, the people who are in better uh, state of health seem to fare the COVID experience better than those people who are in a compromised state. 
So if that's not a reason for us to pay attention to our wellness and these underlying sleeper things that might be going in the body, going on in the body, you know, what, what is, look at all the officers that we've lost and it's a tragedy. I thought you were talking more longitudinal. I'm sorry. Well, no, I, I, so my, my point in bringing it up is that it's, it's one of those canary in the coal mines right there. And if it just kind of goes back to the old adage, right? Strong people by their very nature are just harder to kill, right? If you're strong and you're fit, um, you're going to survive things that you otherwise wouldn't survive. And uh, the, you know, the, the sad truth about COVID is that it, it's getting the people that are metabolically deranged are the ones that have uh, the biggest trouble with it. And on top of that, the, it, if you're suffering from long COVID, uh, the, one of the first things you should probably do is go get your blood sugars tested and, and see what those levels look like. And there are, you know, there are nutritional interventions. There are things that you can do that can, that can change the trajectory of that. But, um, and, and I, you know, sadly, I'm not a doctor, but I didn't, you know, I didn't even sleep in a holiday inn last night. So, uh, I'm just, I'm just telling you what I know from, from my own experiences and, you know, people, uh, th- but the data in terms of officer fatalities, you know, that that's, that's real, that's hard data. That that's hard truth right there, but tangent back to the alcohol. Sorry, folks. It's no good for you. Um, yeah, the, the, re- the only redeeming, uh, thing in it is that it does uh it does provide there there is some social benefit to yeah. so, you know, but isn't, g- it like, like, isn't it like the cortisol levels like let's not demonize alcohol right it it's yeah. in it's in the frequency of use it, it it's in balance you know if you want to use alcohol to celebrate something in a social occasion that's probably a healthy use of alcohol uh, but you know one of my one of my friends and mentors uh, and a woman who asks is one of my life coaches Amanda Kuda says you know when you're using the same substance to celebrate things as you are to when when you're trying to escape things like same things to celebrate your highs as you are to try to escape from your lows. You're giving that one substance a great deal of power, right? Yeah. And 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 do you want that thing to have that much power over your life, over your emotional state? You know. Yeah, uh, and I talked to uh, so Alan Hendrickson. He's uh, one of the coaches also, but I've had him on the show and his his show. Oh my gosh, he is he, he's uh, what you were telling me earlier about when you were young, working narcotics, drinking every day. He was a young officer assigned to a uh, a drug task force. He went undercover, work, not like just like working his own area, but he would like travel. Like, mm-hmm. so he was, you know, being, you know, undercover for weeks at a time. And, um, you know, he developed a, you know, an addiction to alcohol. He, you know, he had some serious issues. Um, but he's since, you know, he's rebounded and he tells the story now, you know, it's, it's, his story is very inspiring, right? Because if you are someone that is struggling with, with alcohol use, you know, there, you know, he's a prime example of that. You can get past it. Um, you got to get to the, you know, and, and coaching isn't the, isn't, isn't the answer, you know, that's, that's EAP, that's, that's uh treatment, you know, there's a much more extensive, uh, protocol that you're going to have to use to, to get through it. But, um, that, that, you know, those are on the extreme sides, but for, but just for the everyday cop, right. It's, I think it's important to understand that if you're, if you are someone that's drinking a couple beers at the end of your shift, you, you may not be getting drunk. You may not ever be impaired. It may not ever impact your ability to think and make decisions, but I can promise you this uh, and that the science is very clear on it. It is impacting your rest and your recovery. And it's mm-hmm. impacting uh, your heart rate variability. Right. Your your central nervous system is being affected by it. So yeah, and and your sleep. You know, so like after you have a couple drinks, eat, not drink to pass out, just even a couple drinks, you get something called pseudo sleep instead of regular sleep, and that's where you plunge into a very deep sleep. And then you go up into a lighter sleep and often you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're struggling to fall back to sleep. A regular sleep cycle has you bouncing 
back and forth between deep sleep and, and REM sleep. And then you have the moments of light sleep as well, but you're going up and down all night. That pseudo sleep plunges you really, really deep. Now the deep sleep that you would have gotten throughout the whole entire night in your natural cycles is all front end loaded because you put this depressant in your system and now you can't get back into your natural sleep cycles. So the restorative stuff that you're talking about it doesn't happen in pseudo sleep. Passing out and going to sleep are different. And if you're using alcohol to help you sleep, you are not using the right substance to help you sleep. There are yeah. other things out there that will help you sleep. Alcohol just helps you numb it out. All right. So there's the bad news, folks. Not saying don't don't drink, but certainly saying um don't drink every day. Listen to that, listen to that podcast. You know, you know, you can read the, you know, he always cites his work. You can read the the studies yourself. Um, if you're a doubter or, well, and the other or, thing is, or if you know, you're disappointed they, and you're wanting, yeah. if you're trying to find ways to justify to yourself why you're going to do it anyway. Uh, well, and I think what a really important thing is like, and this is a concept that didn't come to me until a little later in, in, in life, but uh, numb the dark, numb the light. Right. And this is exactly what happened to my dad. Like he's using this alcohol to try to numb, um, you know, all of all of the cumulative uh, stress. Right. My dad's probably got PTSD, but he, he won't go and get treatment. So he hasn't been diagnosed. But, you know, so when you use it to numb the dark, you know, you, your lows don't get low, but your highs don't get so high either. And now you can't you're, you're numbing the light. So you're not maybe you're not experiencing the same sadness or, or depression or whatever it is. But you're you think you're not right. But you're also not experiencing the same joy. And that's why alcohol is a depressant. Right. Because it, it, it brings that joy down. And so numb the dark, numb the light. That's I think Marianne Williamson or somebody. But, it, you know, it's a powerful statement. All right. Well, we've been going for a while, so uh, let, I want to try to to um, let's let's look for for a landing spot here. Now, you, as accomplished um, as you are, there's still one thing that you haven't talked about yet, and that's your book. Um, sure. You wrote a book. I would, I, if you wouldn't mind, please just telling. Sure telling the audience a little bit about it and uh, where they might be able to pick up a copy. Sure. Uh, so the book's available on Amazon. It is called Officer Safety Redefined. And the premise of the book is to start getting officer wellness to be part of the officer safety conversation. Because like you said, officers are dying of suicide. Officers are dying from COVID. Officers are dying from heart disease. And you look at those things and it's the numbers are magnified over the other line of duty deaths. And like Gil Martin said in his book, we're training, we're training, we're training for these physical threats that may or may not come to us. These psychological threats are sure to come to us from the stress exposure of our job. And we're just not training or talking about those threats. The psychological threats of the profession are just as real and as just as dangerous as the physical threats. And we need to start making officer wellness part of the officer safety conversation. If you're if you're a leader right now that's listening to this podcast and you're thinking, okay, what the hell is an aura ring? Uh, I've never heard what is whoop. <laughs> like these things kind of sound uh, a little crazy, a little far fetched. Um, the you know where do I start? What do I do? You know what would be what would be your advice to one of your fellow chiefs about? All right, we we have a you know we have an EAP program. Maybe we have a gym, maybe we don't, but what are, what are some of the things that we can start to do uh, to move in a, in a, a more positive direction in terms of uh, officer wealth and officer wellness? Well, I, you know, I think it starts with each and every one of us in leadership position. And if you're in a leadership position and you want to create a culture of wellness uh, in your agency, you need to create a culture of wellness in your life. And so like the aura ring for me, it started with me and my family doing it. I thought it was so valuable for us. I wanted to share it with my team. I was working with a life coach for a couple of years. Uh, when I came to this agency, I saw some of the officers kind of struggling to get direction with me as a new chief. And I brought in a coach and offered everybody uh, to, to work with the coach, the phone sessions, you know, um, but, you know, that my agency provided that. We did not have a workout facility when I ha got here and I had $500 and we took a room in an outbuilding. It's like kind of like a warehousey, you know, like uh, steel frame building. 
morning and we bought some horse mats from Farm and Fleet. We got uh, ourselves a pull-up bar. We got some off-market TRX straps and we had the, the facilities guy make us some plyo boxes and we got some CrossFit posters up and we just kind of started doing it together. We started accountability tracking. Uh, we started hiking together. We got some rucksacks to hike with because that changes a hike and makes it into a workout. Um, and, uh, you know, you just have to walk the talk and you have to lead the way. Um, the other thing is you've got to let your people know. And if you're going to do this wellness thing, it has to be about the people above the organization. You have to be trying to create a culture of wellness because you know it's better for your people and it's better for their families. We have a mantra here at uh, my work and it is healthy is happy and happy is hardworking. Uh, I implemented uh, these wellness protocols. I, I allowed them to work out on duty. Uh, we, we started having real conversations about wellness. We got the aura ring. Um, I measured uh, productivity and sick time usage after 12 months, my sick time usage uh, was unscheduled, right? Uh, down 67% and our self-initiated field activity was up 300%. We weren't having conversations about sick time usage or productivity. We were just having officers take better care of themselves. We put oranges out in the snack room and almonds instead of you know, craptastic donuts and candy bars. Uh, we put a Vitamix in the kitchen. And when we ordered lunches, we ordered healthy lunches instead of non-healthy lunches. Uh, the small changes make a big difference. And if you invest in your people and you can create a, a, a worker who's happier, um, Sean a Aker at, at Harvard in the positive psychology division, you know, happy people are 30% better at, they're 30% more productive, they're 30% more efficient, they're 30% better at problem solving. Well, like that's exactly the numbers that I saw, um, you know, in, in, in my, my data, like this, this productivity, I mean, it, it went up so much per officer. And then you, you bring that together for an agency and you've got really big results. You know, so uh, I think start having conversations, find out what your people want. When I first approached it, I approached it with all of my ideas. They rejected all of my ideas. <laughs> I canceled it. We reset. I said, what are your ideas? They came forward, gave me their ideas, and we we found a place to start from. That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, the, the great thing about fitness, like, you know, we, we talk about CrossFit, but it, it, and I, when I put the uh, nonprofit CrossFit affiliate in our, in our training center. <laughs> yeah. People were freaking out, you know, when they, cause they thought I was going to start making everybody do CrossFit. And, you know, for me, it was just look, uh, uh you know, when, when we were asking people, uh, why they're not working out, why they're not exercising. Well, I don't have time. It costs too much. I have no place to go. I don't want to go to a local gym. You know, I, the list can go on to the thing. The reasons why it's okay. Well, uh, uh you know, we just, you know, tried to remove barriers to, to get people, to get people to access to information and equipment and the things that they will need. Um, yeah, I, I will give a, a, a shout out to like, uh, one of, one of the uh, companies we brought in, uh, is a company called O2X. I think I'm sure a lot of you guys are, that are listening are familiar with them. Uh, they did a lot of work in, in the, on the fire side first, but now they, they do work with police departments. Um, you know, one of the, one of one of our officers that ran our training tra training program uh, actually went on to to go through their training program as well. But uh, they you know they they'll come in. They have an app. They give you the resources, nutrition advice. They give you access to coaches that that have expert ex exercise physiologists, nu uh, nutritionists. Uh, you know, literally build uh, workout programs for you. You can track your programs. But we use. Um, we use their testing for, for our baseline, for our annual physical fitness test that we do at our police department. Uh, and we set that up in a way to, to uh, where, you know, it, it eventually is going to become a mandatory standard. Um, it's not something mandatory that you have to do. There's a, there's a new boss there now. So he, you know, he can ultimately decide where he's going to go with it, but that's where I was heading. And I was very clear and intentional in, in telling people uh, and, and, I, but I was giving them, a, a long runway to get there. It wasn't like, Hey, end of this year, you either pass this test or you're gone, you know, type of thing. And, and as many times as I said it, uh, the, you know, there was always a few that always just felt like it was, it was 
me trying to get rid of uh, like a an unfit cop and it had nothing to do with that it it it's just i i know that if you're if you're healthy you're going to make better decisions yep. which is which is going to be better for you at work um better for you at work is better for me <laughs> You know, as an administrator, I, I want you to go out and be successful. And uh, I, I don't want you dying young. Um, I, I yeah, don't and want we've you got, having At this point, outcomes. we've got 90% of the agency is taking advantage of the on-duty workouts. And so uh, it, that's insane. I like, and I'm so happy, but that, you know, that's the evolution of the program. And and so I went to the guys that weren't taking advantage of it and and said, what do you need? What do I have to put in the workout room, you know, in order for you to start working out on duty, you know, and, and I listened to them and the one guy said a Peloton, right? So we ended up buying a Peloton and then a month passed and he didn't work out. And I was like, Hey, Hey, you said, if I got a Peloton, you'd work out on duty. What happened? Well, you know, as soon as I called him out on it, as soon as their accountability's there, he's like, you're right. I just, I got to bring my gym clothes in, blah, blah, blah. A couple months passed. He's 17 pounds down. He said he's sleeping better than ever. He's got new energy for his kids. His wife said he's in a better mood all the time. Um, because once people start taking care of themselves in a better way, it becomes a addictive, right? It, it, I mean, they see the benefits Absolutely. and then, then they never want to go back. Yeah. And that's a, um, and, and, you know, every agency is going to be different, right? And everyone's going to have their, everyone's going to have limitations. And one of my biggest concerns in, in your, our agency, you know, we're experiencing the same thing that everybody else is, uh, just not getting the number of applicants coming that we need to be able to, to keep manpower where we want it. Uh, you know, the attrition rate is, is higher, you know, over the last five years than it was the previous, you know, five to 10 years uh, across the country. I was reading, I was reading an article literally right before we started our podcast about Gwinnett County and a uh, suburb of Atlanta. You know, they're down 20, their workforce down 25%. You know, that's a very large agency. They're like should be, wow. should be just under a thousand officers. They've got, uh, you know, 600 and some. Uh, so, when when this happens, and this is kind of like my my plea to the public too, and my plea to uh, it, you, the the political leaders and and people that have influence on how we invest and how we fund and, and how we resource police departments. When when you have a busy agency, you might not your patrol guys might not be able to go uh, work out on duty because why? Because you're too busy. There's you know mm -hmm. the, you, uh, there's calls for service. Um, but not every agency is like that. If your agency ha has the capacity to provide for workouts on duty, you, you should be doing that. And you should have a gym for them. And if you don't have a gym for them, uh, you should be finding ways to get them access to uh, privately owned facilities. Uh, and there's tons of people that will partner with you. Yeah, um, fire departments, high schools. I mean, right. There's so many community yeah. partners. I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the best things to do if and again, for a, for an officer that is going to start an exercise program that hasn't exercised in a while, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in, you know, getting a physical. That was one thing that we, you know, in our agency and most most police departments do this, but not all of them. Right. Mandatory, uh, ex, you know, physical every year. You have to at least go. Um you know, sadly, some people go and doctor, oh, how things good, good, just sign off. Um, but there's a reason why there's so much undiagnosed cardiovascular disease in policing is because most standard of care doesn't know the uh, particular risk factors that that public safety workers have, and, and, you know, particularly police officers, because of the things you were mentioning earlier, elevated stress. So get a blood test, get a stress test. Uh, get a uh, get a heart scan. They're fifty bucks, and right. yeah, and uh, find out these things. Uh, do it, but you know, don't not do something right. You know, the, the whole point is is really just uh, remove the barriers that you can. You don't have to start. You know, you don't have to get this nice big shiny package and get it started. It literally can just like you said. Um, you know, f carve out. You know, you know, clean out an old closet. And you know, put a bench and some weights, a couple dumbbells, a couple kettlebells, yep. whatever you can find. Um, partner with your high schools, 
partner with somebody, you know, uh, but, but find ways to start uh, to get moving. Um, when we start taking better care of our, ourselves, th- this profession, it, it gets, it gets a lot brighter. You know, it's like, it's like we're all fresh and new officers again, before all, all that weight of all that negative stuff started to come in because we're, we're readjusting the biochemistry of our brain by engaging in proactive health care, self-care, preventative measures. So it's great. If anyone's got any questions about what you've done and how maybe how to start a program like that for themselves, is there a way that they can reach out to you or do you have a, a, a preferred communication platform? Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so social media is, uh, it's a dark place for me, so I don't spend a lot of time there. So that's not a good way to get me, but uh, I will give you my work email. It is L King K I N G at mccdistrict.org. So L-K-I-N-G at mccdistrict.org. I have wellness policy I'd be willing to share. I can, I, we have a presentation on a write-up of our program. I'd be happy. Uh, my way is, is not the right way and it's not the only way, but it is a way, especially if you're starting with nothing, Uh, Because I'm not a well-funded agency with a lot of resources. I'm a person that got real creative and built something from from scratch. Awesome. Your your officers are fortunate to have you. That's very progressive leadership. It's uh, it's officer centric. It's officer oriented. And that that's quite frankly, uh, what we what we need to to keep pushing forward. Uh, we need to invest in our people. Our people are our greatest resources. Um, yeah. And I've got a bunch of happy cops and it makes it a really great place to work. And so <laughs> that's because of what they're doing, not because of me, but but I'm letting them do it. Right. And so so. Yippee, <laughs> let's make police work happier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. There's another T-shirt. Let's make yep. police work happy. Uh, happier. All right. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it, uh, Dr. Laura King, for spending some of your valuable time with us. And uh, we're going to set up another episode at some point. But until then, we're 1042. Log into www.performance-protocol and learn more about how to bring this program to your agency and community.